Good morning. How are all of you? Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Everyone. I know it's early, but I was wondering if any of you had any specific questions or issue, issues you'd like to ask about what you called in about this morning. I do. I do. I broke my server. <laughs> Oops. So uh, it's timing out and it's the spawn is failing. I can share my screen quickly here. I put a, a message on the Slack, but it, it, it has given me more errors. So show share. Here it is. Nope, screen two. There you go. See, share. Mm. And we started doing that last night. Have you tried that other server option? The hook? Yeah. Um, But it's slow this morning, but. What were you doing for um, the server crash? Were you by chance doing large data processing? <laughs> That's what I, what I was about to say. I, I, oh, this works. I was downloading more data because for the uh, tops processing, I tried different locations and I was not pleased. So I was uh running for a new site and getting more data and i cannot specifically correlate with that in terms of time very closely because i i i set the uh that step of download to progress and i went to do some some other stuff so and i know that there is a basically a hard drive limit on these instances so the first thing i do is if there's data you're not using anymore go ahead and delete it yep. yeah that would be the first big step that I would do. Okay. So the other uh, question is, w once I download in this uh, server, the no hook, should I go back to the regular server, stop this no hook, or, or how do I proceed? I would go back to the, like, once you have everything cleaned up, I would leave, shut it down, and then go back to the hook version. Okay. Yep. So now I have a follow-up question, and that's part of the reason where I was doing multiple things uh, for the tops. I was processing data that I found later looking at the logs that is just outside the RS SRTM uh, DM coverage. Mm -hmm. So at northern latitudes of plus 60, beyond plus 60. So are there any options of other DM data sets that I can import via the, the notebook to be able to process the fringes on the location I want to process? Not via the notebook. Not I yet. There, yeah, no, not that I know via the notebook, although I know that um there is there is that ARIA is working on other options for northern latitude DEMs. ASF when they process in the north, um Using say something like Hype Three, they use there's a Coper there are several other DEMs. You can get the Copernicus DEM, which goes further north. Um, there's Arctic DEM, which covers much of the Arctic and the Antarctic. Um, there's a couple others that aren't as good. Those are the two sort of best quality ones out there that you would want to look at. The um, issue is that once you get them, you need to you will need to convert them to the right SRTM format and projection. And mm -hmm. make sure, and you have to make sure you're not in number values are the, are what um, ICE expects to find. There's a very particular not a number value ICE expects to find in a DEM, and, and many DEMs have not a number. They have NANs in them, um, and so you'd use GDAL to convert it to the format you want, and then to the format that ICE wants actually, and then you would um, place it in the right location and probably change your notebook to give it that name and location. Um, that'd be the, I think the simplest way to make it work with a notebook, right? So you change the name and in the notebook, you, you, you'd give it its own name in the notebook, you change its name or you, and you make sure you had it in the right location that ICE expects to find it. 
Okay. Yeah, and people have encountered this problem before, and there's actually a good Python package out there that you could install into your environment to do a lot of this stuff. It's called yeah. Sardem. Which one? What is that? It's called Sardem. I just posted a link to the Sardem. GitHub page. Oh, great. Uh, I will do that because I, I don't think I'll have enough time or bandwidth to uh, try this in the course, but it's something that I, I really um, need to do. Yeah, most of us who work in places that aren't anywhere in the SRT that aren't in the SRTM world absolutely have to do this on a regular basis. So yeah, you'll want to, you'll want to do that. Okay. Uh, GitHub. Cool. Excellent. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And uh, I, I actually, I actually usually, usually actually prefer the Copernicus DM uh, mm -hmm. rather than the SRTM if I manage it, if I could use it, like for example, using the SARTM package, because uh, uh, the Copernicus DM is from the Tandem X data. So that's from the 2010, while the SRTM is around the 2000. So it's actually, so the later one is a newer DM and uh, it actually reflects better off the ground surface. Yeah. At, le at least for modern satellites, if you think about the fact that the Sentinel data has been collected since. 2014-15. Um, if you when you're working with a with a DEM that's from 2000 and, and SRTM has its defects, it always has. Um, you you want you do want to work with one that's as current as possible. Yeah, I, I've used the Dart Arctic DEM, which is I think two meters per posting, in, yep. in, the, in the past, but but not in the context of SAR or INSAR. It was just uh, looking at. But but I think what I think. I think I think what we're trying to say is that in general, once you get Sardem to work, in general, the Copernicus DEM is more modern everywhere in the world, including yes. where SRTM is. So there is an advantage to you know once you've got that automated for yourself to working with it on a regular more rate with all of your data rather than just um, the, in the north or the south. Copy that. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, Thank for you. all of ASF's on-demand instar processing, we use the Copernicus DEM. All right, I'll uh, work on all my stuff now. Thank you. And I think last year we actually used the SARDEM for for this course because in the last moment uh, the USGS server is down, so there is ah. not there anymore. And uh, Scott Stanowitz, who is the guy who is like JPL, write this package, and he made actually one option. That's minus ice. Then it will download the um, the Copernicus DEM, uh, given the bounding box, and prepare that in the format that ice is expected. Oh, so I, I will look at the UNAFCO twenty twenty two uh, notebooks <laughs> for yeah. for code. Yeah, and actually, the uh, Scott actually write a very nice uh, documentation on GitHub. If you just click the link, and then it will show very clearly how to use it. It's it's pretty. Yeah. It's very simple, actually. Mm -hmm. It's a good little package. Oh, that's encouraging. Okay, great. Other questions or issues people had? Uh, hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So I have a problem about the area stack I was preparing yesterday. Based mm -hmm. on uh, may I share my screen? Sure. Uh, can you see my screen? Nope. Not yet. Yep, there it is. Okay. I I run all the step, I guess, <laughs> for a track forty three. Mm-hmm. 
between the range 36 to 42 and 36 to 42 from from two uh, second of february 2020 to i guess second of uh, november this is just arbitrary dates i get some products mm -hmm. and uh, then when i was going for stacking with these with these like, mm -hmm. uh, i i did not give any box here because i want to get all the frame of the of the products mm -hmm. but when i i check after the after doing everything when i checked that uh, what is the region but i get only this one like this is for the water mask I mean, it's it's very short. It is not showing any deformation in this region. I mean, there is no data. Uh, I also checked for the deformation for one interferogram. It shows like, I mean, it is not covering anything. Although it takes around two, three hours. I think two or three hours to download and then stack the products and produce some other folders like uh, coherence, incidence angle, products, and DEM as well. But uh, the same for but when yeah. I check when I check on the DEM that but mm -hmm. there is there show some like range. Upper left, uh, lower left, uh, it covers everything the the one the frame I wanted to download. Yeah, I, I tried multiple times, but with different combination it's showing the same but i see that there are there are frames on the asf website having uh, unwrapped uh, geocoded interferograms so, so stop for a second sorry could you just go back up so i can see the range for a second i'm just trying to figure out what exactly what's going on here right there thank you stop yeah Is this data on the very edge of an island or a coast? I'm uh, sorry. Is this data on the very edge of an island or a coast? No, no, it it's looks... in the, it's it's in the Turkey. It's like in the north of Turkey. Okay. But I, I think that you're just missing the frame further south. I think that when you if you go back up when you grab the data, you. Um, but I see that there in the products there are like forty three tracks and it is giving me almost all images. The one I was looking for, it was around 90 something. Yes, but I think you uh, you often have to do a search for an area that's a little bit yeah. larger than what you actually want to cover. So I think yeah. you need to give the uh, search area going much, maybe another one or two degrees further south. Uh, it is, I, I give like, uh, I can show you. Yeah. I, I give 36 to 42 in the in the uh, right but if you start yeah. at 35 maybe that will be enough to grab all the data that you need mm -hmm. yeah, but yeah. I, I, I tried with this one like initially I gave around 37 to 30 uh, 37 to 40 then I increased one degree for both direction but it's still showing the same like so my question um, is do, my question is do, are you looking for data further south or further are you is, is there is there is there i mean this is fringes, are you, yeah. yeah are there fringes you think are missing to the north that's my question it, it, i'm not really quite sure what you think you're missing when i look at it i think oh you're missing data to the south but is it actually the data between 41 and 42 that you that you're looking yeah. for no i'm looking for 36 to 41 around 36 to 41 it's yes. like so, so is it the part of the Turkey? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that should be over the land. Yeah. So you're missing really the stuff which is south. Because see your right. latitude. Yeah. And you wanted to go to 36 but, but, down. Further south. Yeah. 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 You, yeah, you're you're crop somehow or other you're missing the frame for, to the south. Eric's right. You wanna you wanna you wanna go further south, 35, 34 in your yeah. bounding box and try that first. Mm 
maybe it's not about the bounding box, but you selected the frames. So maybe you need to add a frame because yeah. now it's just like the bounding box crop only the frame you have. How many frames you downloaded? Did you select only that 33? Uh, maybe just cover that part only. And I checked on the ASF website. I think it's not open, but I can try like. And I just noticed that um, your bounding box is huge, like huge, yeah. very, very big, uh, yeah. 60 by 6 degree. And actually, um, one track of Sentinel-1 is only about 2 degrees wide in you know along the longitude yeah. direction. So I think you may want to adjust the, your bounding box. Yeah, like for this this region, I, I searched for it and it shows me some interferograms in the third, uh, 43 track. This Just click search. Uh, I, I was looking for the path, but it is here. Yeah, 43. No. Forty three, I think it is here further, further here. <clears throat> What is that inside of this? Would you see the path on the left is like 14 or 116? So are you sure about that 43? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This one is not the 43 and 43 is, is in this direction, but I am using some other tools too. That's why there are some problems in my selection. I don't know why. Can, can you just do a minimum lat, minimum long, minimal latitude and maximum okay. latitude? Wouldn't that be simpler in, in terms of trying to do this quickly rather than the drawing thing? Hmm. No, no, no. Yeah, no. Um, yeah. If if you go to the um filters, yeah. okay. If if you click on that for a second, here yeah, filter. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um. Can you just make a nice small small area of interest right where you want it, and then and then search for the tools that way. Search for the data that way. Okay. Okay. It doesn't have to be really big for now just to get an idea yeah. of what's there
I don't know why it is, but initially I, I checked that. It... Don't use the path for a second. Just do that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Just do it. Yeah. Not, it should be something here. Maybe I am I applied like a sand. Yeah, maybe this way. Maybe descending. You had to you canceled out of your search. Yeah. You have to actually press search. I don't think your filters um yeah, no. later around don't clear the search yet <laughs> sorry <laughs> <laughs> i can i can uh, plot again so try a rectangle to see like this one So there, there are some frames like this one. If I so we see there, there is a frame, but the, I don't know how to go back. So it is track forty three ascending. But uh, in, in like this is quite big if it is from like uh, thirty eight to I mean if we go up thirty eight to forty uh, point two latitude, but it is not showing any result when I do area tools. To download and uh, even DEM, uh, I think it, it is not searching well, so that's why DEM is only lies in the same region where we have the def, uh, interferons. Um, so can we go back and so so that's that's the frame you think you're working with right there. Yeah. And so it may be in the mask that's getting made. It could be that that's where the problem is. Right. Mm. Mm -hmm. Is there, is there any option that we can we can manually check that the why this is I mean we are getting the products uh, from product and then I see that there are products available but when it is going to stack and create the other unwrapped phase in incidence angle it may have problem. Well, 
If you go down for a second, in that no 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 no, so you see the this in there. One. Yeah, you have an er you have an error in there in some way. Uh, I run it again. That's why it is error. Otherwise, it was completed once, and okay. I checked. And it was the same. Okay. Same Just checking. Thanks. Yeah. Just checking. Um. I, in, my issue is I don't know the ARIA download tools well enough to know if you can if you can play with those variables and check them and see if that's part of it. You'd have to you have to um, email their help and find out or some or or try actually for now try the um the Slack channel and see if if they've got some suggestions for what's going on there. Yeah, I wrote on the Slack channel and yeah. uh, Eric it, has responded me. About yes, <laughs> Eric's good that way. Yeah. But it's still pretty early in uh, California for mm -hmm. JPL people who might be answering that Slack. So mm -hmm. I apologize. I just don't know. I don't know the RE tools well enough to know what might be going on there mm -hmm. internally. Do we want to move on to the next question? Okay, thank you very much for the time. I would, uh, I think, stop share my screen. Other questions, other issues with the yesterday's work, yesterday's tools, or any time in the past couple of days, something you've been working on on your own? Uh, another thing I forgot to ask: Can or uh, can we stitch two frames like the one? Uh, we stitch this frame and the lower one. Yes, uh, the Aria tool uh, TS setup will automatically stitch frames if the, if they're from the same track. Uh, that's one of the big um, advantages of how the Aria tool systems work. Yeah, which is why Eric was saying if you pick a bigger region, you may get more of, of what of the of what you want, right? Because it'll stitch like the frames together I, for I, you. Yeah, if I select this region, it will automatically stitch the lower one. Do or do I have to select some 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 parameters like some commands in the in this? No, when you if you just have all the different uh, products in the same product directory, then they uh, it'll automatically. Um, stitch them together. Uh, there are some uh, extra tools uh, uh, in ARIA tools. I'm trying to see what I forget. It's been a while since I used all these mm -hmm. tools. There's one that does the display of the area. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, I can share the screen again to see if it is like maybe I I can try with that. Mohammad, I would just uh, suggest you actually to try a much smaller bounding box with the okay. tools, because I mean from the from the SF search, it looks like there's a lot of data, but uh, what you're downloading is actually a much smaller portion of it. Uh, I would be I would be guess a lot of there may be a lot of data gaps in the mm -hmm. big bounding box that you specified. Okay. Just, I, uh, I can... Yeah. I'll, for example, if 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 I were you, I would try maybe just a a half degree by half degree of a size, and then to see if it works on on that area. Mm -hmm. And I would not skip the bounding box in the area tier setup. So that both the area download and the area tier setup use the exact same binding box. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, there are few few like this one. There there is a stitch, uh, stitch method type. Like if I if I simply write minus sm uh, here, then it will stitch the multiple frame multiple frames of the same track. <clears throat> yes, if on the same if they're on the same track, 
and if the adjacent frames are both available yeah so it was stitch and then you can see there are three stitch methods and mm -hmm. then they are perfect so there will be sometimes imperfect stitching which will result as unwrapping errors which you can actually later work, uh to do a further corrections in the mid pass stage uh, we will show okay. that on friday okay so there are sequential uh, minimize uh, sequential overlap and so i need to select uh, minus sm and then for me i actually usually when i run it i just use the default one which works fine i think mm -hmm. they recently changed the default stitching uh i think it's from overlap to sequential yeah. which was very recently added okay and the and the things show seems to show uh, much better and a more reasonable behavior. Uh, so no, the uh, the thing you want to use is Aria plot. There's an Aria plot program, and that'll show you what the area is of the air, of the data that you have downloaded. Yeah, that's that's the program. I was uh, I think we didn't cover that in the tutorial, but if you look mm -hmm. on Aria Tools Docs. Mm -hmm. GitHub, uh, then there's a tutorial on ARIA plot. Okay. Uh, it's on, under assessing data quality and spatial temporal coverage of interference. Okay. I will try it. So thank you very much again. So I would stop share to have opportunity for others to share something. <laughs> Others, anyone else? Oh, there's one in the chat. Mm. Oh, I think that's more of a question for Eric, to be honest. I'm sorry, Eric. Uh, the chat, oh, I didn't have the chat it's open. About, yeah, I did, I, I, mine just popped <clears throat> up. It's about the um, pro, um how the how the proxy, but what the spatial and temporal criteria is for building the the polygons and the um uh, for flood and damage. Um, I, I know a little bit about the flood one, but I don't know how the damage. I don't know how the other damage ones are done. So I know uh, that yeah, we we generate damage proxy maps when there's a request for certain uh, disasters. It's a it since it's a fair amount of uh, uh work to process those uh products. We we only do it when there's a a request from some. A country or agency that uh, for a specific disaster. Eric, I don't. Th I mean, I'm actually also wondering. Uh, I don't think the area damage proxy map uh, workflow or code is uh, accessible to any people outside of JPL, right? No, it's not on GitHub. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the uh, the main author uh, of of the damage proxy map code did didn't want to put it on GitHub. Um, it's not me. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> and the flood map uh, similar area produced those, and uh, the Opera project from from JPL also produced those, and those uh, flood map flooding map. Uh, generate from both uh, Sentinel-1 and 2. And they're already op operationalized and it's already uh, updated in near real time and available from, from where? I think it's from ASF, right? Yeah, it's from uh, ASF, yeah. It's yeah, from Opera, Office. the Opera uh, digital, uh, I mean, the dynamic surface water extent products. Uh, their present version is made from the harmonized Landsat Sentinel-2 archive and it's so it's made from the optical data and they're still uh developing the final version of the sentinel one sar version of the uh, dynamic surface water extent so that's yeah. the the sar version is not yet uh, released but the uh the optical version that's based on the harmonized landsat sentinel two uh data is released yeah franz and i have a project um, to do 
it's a, a small project that works on those a little bit. And I know that it's almost done largely. The, the workflow is largely done. But and the um and the and the product is globally, so includes Chile, of course. Yes, the Opera Digital Dynamic Surface Water Extent is a global product. They're also going to be uh, releasing the, uh, I think uh, in October, they're going to be releasing the um, radiometric terrain corrected Sentinel-1 products, which are the intermediate products that are used for the uh, surf surface water extent products. Uh, so those will also be available as intermediate products, uh, I think, starting in October, globally. The uh, Sentinel products are going to be the RTC, the radiometric terrain corrected products are going to be available on a, a Sentinel-1 burst um, basis. So uh, people can get the area they want. And I think an, uh, another nice thing about Opera is the code development is public and open source on GitHub. So you can check it now on GitHub if you like. But just to be noted, the as Eric said, the development is still in, in the development. So the algorithm that code are not finalized yet. They're also doing a, a, a full uh, calibration and validation effort. So once the products are released, that means that they have been calibrated and validated against um, other data sets. Uh, so uh, it's taking a little bit longer to release the final versions because we're do they spend several months doing this calibration and validation step. There is uh, the, the uh, Opera project is also uh, uh, releasing a um, surface disturbance product, which is primarily for uh, vegetation uh, disturbance. Uh, so it's also using the harmonized Landsat Sentinel-2 uh, optical data, and it shows areas where um, forests or other vegetation have been uh, removed or disturbed by fires or, or whatever. That's called the uh, DIST or disturbance product. Any other questions? Absolutely. We're interested in um, sort of any general topic. Oh. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so somebody's asked in the um, in the chat about um, about the difference between what, what are and what are the differences between some of the terms we use all the time. And, and I, I recognize that those of us who work with all this um, software and data um, do use them somewhat in, interchangeably. So I'll take a stab at some of these and then I'll, um, uh, maybe I'll, I'll let you know, Jen and others um, and Eric um, help out. ARIA, um, and I'm gonna give you sort of the outsider's view of ARIA. ARIA and OPERA um, were um, initiatives funded um, by NASA to through the, uh, as part of, or Jason, in, accord, in conjunction with the NISAR mission, the upcoming NISAR mission, as a way to handle and produce, handle the data and produce level three and four products um, for the community um, with time. ARIA was the initial, and again, Eric could tell us a lot more about that, but for, again, from the outside, ARIA was the initial, um, uh, effort there, and it's now called the the extended version of that is called Opera. Um, the um, and ICE is the software that we're all using. Um, the the basic over overarching software package that you that we're using in this course. It was again developed at at JPL. Um, 
uh, originally um, as another program called RightPack, and then it's been been uh, modernized in many many ways since then. Um, Top Step is a is one of the applications inside of it that allows us to process data in a automatic or semi-automatic way using ICE. So it's a it's one of the apps that uses ICE. Um, Strip Map is is simply a that was the right, right way to put it, but it's really a, just a a, um, a strip of data that we processed in, into a into a in, into a set of interferometric data. Um, a time series is is what's generated when you take a bunch of these spatial images, a bunch of these spatial interferometric products. Again, displacement maps usually, or phase maps or displacement maps. And then you create a time series, which is how that change is happening through time at every point in space. And I know I'm going through this pretty quickly, so sorry. And then MintPy is the time series program that we all now use um, with, that is using the large, often ICE products that can be used to create a time series generated by other products like Gamma, but um, which is another commercial software program that can be used to process INSAR data, but largely um, it's formatted so that it takes input. Its input is, is generated, is the data that's generated by ICE and um, it makes it creates that time series for you. And for those, and I don't want to do that fast. And for those of you who know more about all those products or may feel free to jump in, um, know more about those products than I do, feel free to jump in with more details. Uh, thanks. That's a that's an excellent summary. Uh, uh, the uh, the Aria uh, tools that we presented here are to use uh, these Aria processed uh, uh, geocoded unwrapped interferograms that are stored at the ASF DAC. Uh, those are systematically processed interferograms from Sentinel One uh, for certain areas. They're not global coverage, but they're for a number of places. And, and those, because they're pre-processed interferograms, they're e easily downloaded. Then with ARIA tools, you can use the TS setup uh, script to prepare them to put into MidPy. Um, and that's ARIA. I mean, that's ARIA uses the ICE software to process Sentinel-1 uh, TOPS mode data. So it's a uh, uh, it's using the ICE software to, to create those products. The difference between TOPS app and strip map app are because the Sentinel-1 TOPS mode has a very special type of um, data acquisition that requires the use of TOPS app to, to process the uh, data. Strip map app is uh, applicable to a number of satellites that use a simpler uh, acquisition mode that's called strip map. It's a, not all satellites use that, but uh, it, a lot of satellites use that strip map mode. Uh, are there other uh, questions uh, for additional uh, clarification? <laughs> yeah, let me just show you a slide. I made a slide on that previously. Ah, great. <laughs> You see this one? Yes. Excellent. Uh, yeah. So this is basically about that. Um, we have this first go this. We have a lot of uh, INSA processors. Uh, ICE is an INSA processor. SNAP is one uh, developed by ESA. GMT is R. Gamma is a commercial one. Doris uh, developed by TU Deft uh, in Netherlands before and Royal Park which is the previous version of ICE2. And uh, there's a 10 series analysis code, which is usually built on top of the INSA processor products. Uh, so for example, like MintPy, like Stamps, uh, there's a leak SBAS uh, from UK. There's another commercial one called SAPROS and PyRate and Giant, which was uh, originally, uh, um, which was previously from Caltech. And uh, so yeah, so basically we have mainly INSA processors and the TAN series software, which is the downstream workflow. And if we, in this class, of course, we're focusing on ICE and MintPy. And so if we go one another slides, 
which is basically what just uh, Christy and uh, Eric described. We have uh, in this class, we have been so far used TOPS app and StreetMap app, which is both a pairwise processor, which means pairwise means we generate one pair of inference between two SLCs. So if we if if we if our goal is a time series analysis, then we usually need a lot of pairs. But actually, because of the pairwise, so the different pairs we generated, they are actually not in the same grid between each other. So that's where the ARIA tools step in to do the stitch and cropping between different inferograms to make them to make to convert the pairs of inferograms into a stack of, of inferograms. So this is one way, which is what ARIA is using and uh, it's using internally, it's using ICE2. Similarly, from UK, there's an, another database uh, called Lixar from Comet. And uh, they are internally, they are using the gamma code and uh, the HAPI3 services, which is an on-demand processing, which is very nice. Uh, it's from ASF. It's internally currently, it's also using gamma and they are adding I believe Forest is leading the effort. They are now trying to deliver the first wide inferior just very recently, right, uh, Forest? Yep, that's correct. And that'll be using TopSap and ICE2. Yeah. So all these are pairwise processing. And for the pairwise processing, if you want to use that for time series, you need to turn the pairs into stacks. And that means you will need an extra step. Uh, so an alternative way is to generate a stack of inferiority directly from a stack of co-registered SLCs. And I mean, not just two SLCs, they are co-registered to each other. If we give you, if we have 100 SLCs, all the 100 SLCs, they are co-registered in space. So you can just uh, do a, do an inferiority between any of them and generate any inferiorities. So that is what uh, Opera right now is doing. And Opera is internally built on top of i3. Uh, so yeah, basically there are two ways. And uh, both Opera and Aria and the others, uh, they currently are delivering products. Instead of uh, we generate ourselves from scratch, they deliver the inferiorities to us. So we don't need to do that anymore. And we can do the later words part, the orange part, but uh, besides Happy 3 is on demand, all the others, you can just get whatever they are available. If you have a study area that is it by accident, which is a lot of times, uh, they don't have the ARIA products or Lixar products or Opera products available, then we have to generate those INSAR inferograms or SLCs ourselves. So uh, a more a nicer way or cleaner way for time series is later was to do the stack processing. So uh, in ICE2, there is a code for that also. We have TOPS app, which is pairwise. And uh, correspond accordingly, we also have a top stack, which will do the same thing, but in a stack fashion. And similarly, we have strip map stack and ELO stack. And on the last day, our Rovina will demonstrate this part on the stack processing. Yeah, so that's about it. I'm on mute, sorry. Any other questions? I think um, somebody asked a question about Snafu. It was answered in, in the chat. Snafu is an unwrapping algorithm that's used internally in many of these programs. Um, yeah, it only does the unwrapping. It doesn't do the rest of yeah. the processing. <laughs> it's just an internal algorithm. Yeah, and uh, the, the ESA SNAP application does use SNAFU for phase unwrapping. Uh, it, that's that's the option that they chose to use. Yes, yeah, so some some programs like ICE 
allow you to to choose different unwrappers internally, but um, uh, it varies yes. with the program itself, as does as does gamma. GMT star largely uses Snafu, and it always has, unless they've changed that recently. Yeah, the ICU unwrapper uh, is uh, more uh, is faster and um, can be less memory intensive. But it only works when the uh, coherence is high. The ICU yep. unwrapper was actually developed for processing the SRTM data uh, back in hmm. 2000 uh, or 1998. So because yep. it, it, it SRTM because it's a single pass interferometry, there was extremely high coherence, and, and we needed to process long strips. So the ICU breaks the the interferogram up into smaller patches unwraps the patch and then goes to the next patch and determines how they overlap and it, it's designed to process large areas with a moderate amount of memory as opposed to snafu it, it, it can use a huge amount of memory if you're trying to process a large area at high resolution and quick uh, add-on to that is that I don't know if this was already discussed earlier, sorry, but if you want to, Snafu has a bunch of options and can tile the image and unwrap the different chunks with some overlap, and then it figures out how to shift each chunk. And um, that can, if you're looking at a very large, um, high-resolution interferogram with lots of pixels, that can save you a lot of time, and it's fairly robust. Yeah, it's not implemented in ICE. You'd have to do it uh, outside of ICE. If you go to, um, if you kind of Google Snafu and go basically back to the Stanford page, they have, um, if, if it's not already in, when you download it, they have config file um, examples. And if you are comfortable working from the command line, those are, they, they have all the options listed. You can, you know, they're all commented out. You can change the ones you care about. It's a nice way to learn what it can do. Is I3 using the Snafu 2 version 2, right? No, I think I3 is using another unwrapper. I'm not sure. Although I think I've seen in the code that they have, like you can use Snafu inside of I3. It's just not the default or the preferred option. Mm -hmm. But I think it is the latest release of Snafu uh, that they've included inside of ICE 3. Yeah, think? ICE 2 uses uh, uh, version uh, 1.4 of Snafu, which is uh, uh, some years old. But the way it, it's in, it, it was partially rewritten to put it inside the ICE uh, source code and to work with the rest of the ICE software. So they didn't go back and and add back in the uh, Snafu version two that was released later. Snafu, Snafu version two was actually developed for SWAT, the uh, surface water and ocean topography uh, mission that is collecting root single pass interferometry uh, data over the oceans and uh, rivers. Curtis Chen works for the SWAT mission. He's the author of Snafu. Yeah, we haven't talked about SWAT in this uh, because it's uh, it's to look at the uh, elevation of the water in the ocean, surface water and ocean topography. Um, but it's doing a single pass interferometry. It has two antennas uh, to uh, do a single pass interferometry to get the height of the ocean and uh, the rivers around the world.
for any other questions? Um, in the chat, there's a question for Yunjin about the ERA5 correction in mint pie. Yeah, so the, uh, okay. So you're asking, uh, first, there is a uh, min, so min pi uses uh, pi, pi apps, pi APS, a code uh, developed by Roman Jolivet and uh, Pius Agron during the time at Caltech and friends, and uh, that code download uh, ERA5. Uh, it's, it's, it's how, what's the resolution? Current ERA5 is 25 kilometers, around 30 kilometers, right? Yes, I think so. Uh, the other, uh, the, the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting uh, uh, releases different products for different things. Uh, the uh, other, the new software that is still being developed at JPL is called Raider, and that um, is designed to work at the um, higher resolution. Uh, use, it uses the high resolution uh, uh, rapid, uh, what do they call it? HRR. Yeah, the high, high resolution forecasting data. The forecasting data. Yes, yeah. which is what oh, we're going to be using for uh, NISAR. Yeah. And uh, uh, Pablo, you are asking the 10 kilometers one. I know that one is called uh, ERFF LAN, right? Uh, I was aware of that one. I would actually love to use it, but I just uh, don't, don't have time to don't find time to, to try it yet. It should be similar to the ERFF, the general version one, which, as you said, is 30 kilometers resolution. Um, uh, I just have a, I just have don't have a chance to try it yet. I would love to to see to see how it looks like. Yeah, and yeah, it's, it's much a higher resolution, so I assume it should it could be it could potentially be much better. And uh, the ERA five is since still since it is still the ERA five, so that's still the weather reanalysis data. So it's not, it's very different from the weather forecasting data that Eric just mentioned. Yes, that was one of the, the temporal resolution was the other reason that uh, we decided to go with the uh, forecast models because those are uh, es estimated every um, six hours. Yeah, and I just brought that up because there's I've seen cases uh, for Sentinel data in Oklahoma where a storm front went across the entire frame within well within that time period. So it's just something for people to be aware of that the yeah. none of these are perfect and they um, they don't work well at all if things are are changing rapidly. Yeah, I've seen that in Colorado too with storm yeah. fronts coming through and they leave nasty and and the the res the the, the data sets, the correction data sets simply have a hard time accounting for those. It's not, yeah, they just it's not in, they're not really in their purview. And I do want to add another as basically just repeat what Harris said earlier today. Um, um, the um, the tropospheric correction is still a very active area of research. So the current method are uh, are not perfect at all. Uh, so you do we do need still need to work a lot on that and then try a different method maybe for your uh, area of interest. Yes, that's a good note to end on. <laughs> Absolutely. Reached the end of our office hours, and thanks for for dropping in today. We'll be back at uh, ten a.m. Uh, Pacific time uh, with the uh, lectures uh, with the uh, review of yesterday's homework.
see you in uh, at uh, in uh, two hours. Bye. Thanks. Bye.